So here we are, after years of waiting, the full first season of Hasbun Hotel is available to watch. For many, this show came out of nowhere. For others, this show felt like it took a lifetime to produce. And for me, it's the series that will determine if all the controversies and questionable writing decisions by Vipsy Pop were all due to her focusing on crafting a show to follow up on the best animated pilot on the internet. Well, after watching the full season twice over, to say this show is flawed would be a criminal simplification, but to say the show is good or bad is a lie. I'm going to begin with a simplified yet lengthy summary of the events that transpire throughout the series, so if you want to get right to the review, skip to the time displayed on screen. The show starts with the Princess of Hell, Charlie, reading the story of Lucifer's fall from heaven, the creation of hell, and the yearly exterminations carried out by heaven on hell to prevent an uprising. She's interrupted by her girlfriend, Faggy, who brings her down to the lobby to watch an advertisement of the hotel that they have opened, named the Hasman Hotel. The advertisement created by Alistair who helped them create the hotel in the first place is less than stellar, and Vaggy gets mad at him, in which the hotel's only resident, Angel Dust, intervenes, proposing that the advertisement should be a porno instead. While the three are bickering, Charlie gets a call from her father asking her to meet with a representative from heaven in his stead. After traveling to the heaven embassy, she meets with the first man, Adam, where she tries to pitch the purpose of her hotel, which is a hotel that rehabilitates sinners so that they can get into heaven. Adam shoots down her idea and instead drops the bombshell that the yearly extermination is now going to be executed once every six months instead. Charlie heads back to the hotel, and news breaks out announcing the change, putting all of Hell into a panic. Meanwhile, one of the overlords of Hell and Angel Dust's pimp, Valentino, is outraged that Angel Dust moved to the hotel in the first place and convenes with another overlord, Vox, about the situation. Vox couldn't care less about the situation until Valentino mentions that Alistair also resides at the hotel. Turns out that Vox and Alistair are rivals, and Alistair has been missing for seven years, so this is huge news to him, and he wants to get someone inside the hotel to spy for them. Vox then recruits a demon named Serpentius who enrolls in the hotel but is quickly exposed. Instead of being executed like Angel Dust and Vaggy want him to be, he is forgiven by Charlie and becomes a permanent resident of the hotel. While the residents of the hotel are working on trust exercises, Alistair leaves to attend a meeting with the other overlords of Hell accompanied by Serpentius' egg minions. At the meeting, the weapons manufacturer of the overlords Carmilla Carmine begins to discuss the news of the new extermination schedule, but is interrupted by another overlord and the social media manager of Vox and Valentino, Velvet. She presents the head of one of the Angel Exterminators, which is a big deal because up to this point, it was believed the Exterminators were unkillable. Velva suggests that the Overlord should rally and fight the Exterminators now that they know that they can be killed, but Carmilla opposes this proposition due to no one knowing how the Angel even died. After a heated argument between Carmilla and Velvet, Carmilla calls off the meeting, and Alistair orders one of the egg minions to follow Carmilla. The minion witnesses the truth that it was Carmilla who killed the angel to protect her daughters during the last extermination. Alistair returns to the hotel with this knowledge in mind, and gives Pentius back his minions. Once the trust exercises from the rest of the cast are finished, they all move on to show and tell, but Angel Dust is interrupted when Valentino calls him down for a last minute shoot. Charlie is upset by this, and Vaggy tells her she needs to command more authority since she is the Princess of Hell. Charlie, inspired by this idea, goes to Angel's porn studio and tries to get Angel out of work by negotiating with Valentino, but only makes things worse when she catches the studio on fire. Valentino takes Angel Dust into the dressing room and demands that he tell Charlie to leave, and since Angel sold his soul to Valentino, he has no choice but to obey. Valentino then forces him to do an all-night shift, and when he gets back to the hotel, he tries to drink his pain away, but is only ridiculed by the bartender Husk for always putting up a facade to hide away the pain. This causes Angel to storm out, and Vaggy orders Husk to bring him back. Husk tracks Angel Dust down to a club and rescues him when he sees his drink was spiked, but this only causes Angel to get more mad because he just wants to get high enough to forget about all the pain. Husk empathizes with Angel, revealing that he too sold his soul to Alistair, and that they are both losers, but they will just have to work through it together and face the harsh reality that they find themselves in. The two return to the hotel as friends, and Angel forgives Charlie for the trouble she caused. The next day, Charlie is panicking as the deadline for the extermination draws near, and they still haven't made any progress. Vaggy proposes that it's finally time to ask her dad for help, so that she can get a meeting with Heaven to try to convince someone with more authority than Adam. Lucifer arrives and is very hesitant at the notion of Charlie visiting Heaven after what he went through, but after getting to know Charlie better and realizing how important this dream is to her, he arranges a meeting in Heaven for her. 
Charlie goes to heaven along with a reluctant baggie and meets up with the two ruling Seraphim, Sarah and Emily. While Charlie is out sightseeing with Emily, Baggy is cornered by Adam, who recognizes her as one of his ex-exterminators, and blackmails her to try to sabotage the upcoming trial that is going to be held between them and the Seraphims. Once the trial begins, Charlie presents a view of what good Angel Dust is up to in hell, while he's spending a night on the town with his old friend Cherry Bomb and the rest of the cast, and to Adam and Sarah's surprise, he commits a multitude of noble acts such as stopping the hotel's janitor Nifty from stealing cleaning supplies and standing up to Valentino when he preyed on his friends despite him inevitably getting punished for it later. Adam then brings up the point that if he's such a good person, then why isn't he in heaven? Nobody has an answer to this, and Charlie realizes that nobody in heaven actually knows what it takes to pass divine judgment. This causes an outrage as Emily tries to defend Charlie's proposition, and Adam accidentally reveals that he's looking forward to killing Charlie in the next extermination, which up to this point nobody in heaven besides Adam and Sarah knew about. Sarah silences the commotion, and Adam reveals to Charlie that Baggy used to be an angel before he sends her back down to hell. Charlie is heartbroken not only that she failed to convince Heaven, but that Vaggy has also been lying to her, and wallows in anguish until Alistair offers her a deal that would provide her with the information needed to protect themselves from the exterminators in exchange for a favor in the future. Charlie accepts and Alistair tells her about how Carmilla killed an angel, which Charlie then tells Vaggy to meet up with, while Alistair takes Charlie to recruit soldiers to combat with exterminators. Alistair then introduces Charlie to Rosie, who is the leader of Cannibal Town and has plenty of residents to spare. Charlie tries to pitch her idea to the cannibals, but can't focus due to her thinking about how Vaggy lied to her. Rosie then takes her aside so that Charlie can vent her frustrations about the situation, and Rosie reassures her that Vaggy's actions prove that she really loves and believes in Charlie, which brings solace to Charlie and on a second try convinces the cannibals to follow her into battle. Meanwhile, Vaggy convinces Carmilla to reveal the secret to how she killed an angel, which is revealed to be the metal made of the angel's own weapons. Charlie meets Vaggy back at the hotel with the cannibals and a vast supply of angel-killing weapons, and they prepare for tomorrow which will be the day of the extermination. Once the angels finally arrive, a grand battle takes place with the entire cast fighting a losing battle against the angels and Adam, which leads to the death of Serpentius, but Charlie and the rest of the cast are saved once Lucifer arrives to fight as well, completely defeating Adam with barely any effort, who is then killed by Nifty. Adam's right-hand woman, Loot, takes Adam's halo and retreats back to heaven with the rest of the exorcists, and the main cast celebrates their victory while rebuilding the hotel, which was destroyed during the battle. The season then ends on a cliffhanger, where Luke presents Adam's halo to Lilith, who has been in heaven this whole time, and tells her now that Adam is dead and Luke is in charge, the deal that Lilith struck is over and she needs to stop her daughter, Charlie. So in case you couldn't tell from the summary, this show has a comical amount of characters for the 8 episodes it has. Our protagonist and princess of hell, Charlie, certainly is a character that I fell in and out of love with throughout the show. She is still the neurotic bundle of joy we met in the pilot, and although I doubt is going to end up being anyone's favorite character, there are multiple moments throughout the show with her adorable nature that steals many of the scenes she's in, and she's very easy to empathize with as we get to see her go through every emotion throughout the season, be it joy, anger, sadness, or doubt. She's a well-rounded character who fit in and contributed to about every scene she's in, but despite this, I had a really hard time growing attached to her character due to her having some of the weakest arcs of any character in the entire show, which is very shocking considering that she is the central character of this season. It's also worth mentioning that most of my favorite moments with her are caused by her expressing a different side to her character, such as when she's struggling to accept that Vaggy lied to her, or when she's panicking about the hotel not working, which is both a compliment and an insult. She's such a static and predictable character that when she isn't in an unusual situation or mood, she can become very predictable, leading to her becoming an almost boring character if the spotlight is on her for an extended amount of time. By Charlie's side at almost all times in this season is Vaggy. Unfortunately, Vaggy is one of the most unnecessary and infuriating characters in the show. Vaggy retains her aggressive and authoritative demeanor from the pilot, but at the end of the day she only exists in this show to be an accessory to Charlie. She has two big arcs in this season, the first being her taking charge of the trust exercises, and the second being her reveal as an angel. Both of these arcs are entirely focused on her relationship with Charlie not Vaggy as a standalone character. 
Where this becomes a problem is that despite Charlie and Vaggy being with each other so much in this season, they have no chemistry whatsoever until episode 7 and 8. This makes her entire existential crisis she had in episode 3 about failing to be reliable for Charlie not only feel like it comes out of nowhere, because there is never a point where this element of their relationship was established to the audience, but it also rings hollow because it takes until the second to last episode of the season for their relationship to be anything more than them trying to make the hotel work. Like seriously, you could have told me that they were sisters or that they are business partners, and I would have completely believed you, because there is no romance or any sort of connection between these two for most of the series. As a byproduct of this, when she's revealed to be an angel in episode 6, this plot twist is extremely underwhelming because not only does the audience not have a reason to care about their relationship, but also by this point in the series everyone knows that Charlie would forgive Vaggy, since Charlie's primary motivation is second chances. Thankfully, Vaggy wasn't a complete waste of space since in episode 7, it's due to the angel twist that we get Charlie doubting the integrity of their relationship, which was one of Charlie's best moments. But this again all serves to make Charlie a better character, reducing Vaggy to more of a tool to improve Charlie as opposed to a decent character in her own right. There is only one moment in this entire show where Vaggy pulls her weight as a character, when she takes the lead to cheer up Charlie in episode 8 and finally adds some chemistry to their relationship. But of course, even in Vaggy's best moment, there is an underlying problem. The chemistry being sparked between Vaggy and Charlie happens in the 8th episode, which is the last episode of the season. I don't understand how this moment didn't happen in the first episode after Charlie's attempt to convince Adam failed miserably. This would have strengthened their relationship right away and established to the viewer that they really do love each other, making all of Vaggy's following arcs hit so much harder and would have given the viewer a reason to actually care. If I was the writer of this show, I would have just written Vaggy out of the show altogether, as her entire purpose is to be in a relationship with Charlie, but among the worst aspects in this show, Charlie and Vaggy's relationship is one of the greatest offenders. On a brighter note, and almost acting as the exact opposite of Charlie and Vaggy's relationship, in terms of execution, let's talk about Angel Dusk and Husk. Angel Dust is one of the two characters who really does feel different than his pilot counterpart, and not for the better. Angel Dust's wittiness and mean-spirited attitude have both been severely dumbed down in favor of focusing on his nonchalance and his horniness. Oh my god, his horniness. In the pilot, he was the primary representative of sex jokes, but in this show, 70-80% to of all of his dialogue is sex jokes and it is exhausting, not only due to the excessive amount of them, but also just how poorly they are set up or delivered. Thankfully, when Angel Dust isn't making an innuendo, we get a peek into the more insecure and vulnerable side of him that presents the trauma that accompanies the abuse he's going through in a painstakingly raw and unstinted manner to the point where it can be hard to watch. There is an end result to all the pain he endures as we watch him become a better person by episode 6, but with there being only one episode prior that developed his character, him becoming a better person didn't only feel rushed, but artificial. This Angel Dust is a direct downgrade to his original counterpart in nearly every aspect, with his only redeeming quality being how believably pitiful and miserable he is throughout episode 4. But just like how Vaggy was meant to augment Charlie's character, Husk does that for Angel, and it's one of the best parts of the show. Husk is the same as he was in the pilot, but now we finally get to see how he handles Angel Dust's advances on him, and the result is him seeing through Angel's facade and striking at Angel's character flaws in continuous attempts to make Angel Dust self-reflect and at least try to fix himself, instead of giving up on himself. Angel Dust and Husk's dynamic with each other and how they ameliorate each other's personalities is such a strong contender for the best aspect this show has to offer that I almost would rather watch a show that focuses on these two instead of the show that was delivered. And even as his own character, Husk reveals his regrets and mistakes which explains so much about why the way he is, so the audience has a reason to care about him as an individual character and not just as an accessory to Angel Dust. Angel Dust may not be that great of a character in his own right, but when paired with Husk, these two are a spectacle of writing imbued with depth and sincere emotion. 
Alistair, like Angel Dust, is another character who has changed since the pilot, but in a much more subtle way. He's still his non-caring charismatic self, but definitely to a lesser extent. He's not a major downgrade to his pilot counterpart, but he is more mysterious than he is charming, and just like the pilot, he is always keeping the viewer guessing on his true motivations. For once though, his biggest mystery is one that is out of his control, that being what was the deal he made that is confining his freedom. Although Alistair is a fan favorite, I'm pretty indifferent to him. Throughout the series, he never really does anything that seriously impacts the story, and is kind of just an ongoing presence. An apt comparison would be he is like a decoration, always there to be looked at and perceived by others, but at the end of the day, doesn't really have a purpose beyond that for now. Okay, that covers the main cast, but like I said, this show has an absurd amount of characters, so I'm just going to do a quick summary of everyone else. Nifty and Serpentius both serve as the comedy relief characters and are easily the funniest characters in the show. Adam is the central antagonist of the show and is my favorite character despite him being the embodiment of the written by Vivzy Pop meme. Lou is an accessory to Adam. Vox is amazing in every scene he's in. Valentino's character feels inconsistent with him switching between being a moron and one of the most intimidating characters in the whole show. Velvet is perfectly hateable. Cherry Bomb exists only as a running gag for Serpentius. Carmilla Carmine should have been written out of the show, but I will get to that later. Mimsy is a nothing character. Lucifer is a hilarious and great character who ended up being a detriment to the show, which I will also get to later. Rosie was a nice addition and a much needed grounded character. Katie Killjoy had two scenes. Sarah is a representation of the flaws of heaven. Emily should have been Charlie's love interest. And people took St. Peter's design way too seriously. This cast is great. It really is. There are so many characters from every walk of life who serve a purpose, some minor and some major. But there is no denying that there are too many characters to the point where this dynamic cast becomes one of the show's greatest flaws. Because while most of them are interesting, we simply don't have enough time to get to know all of them, and a significant amount of the show is just introducing us to characters who in the long term don't do anything. I already know what happened here. Vivian had created most of these characters years before the show was made, and she wanted to make sure every one of them had at least a single moment in the spotlight. Vivian is very good at designing and creating characters. It's arguably her best skill as a writer, so it makes sense why she would get so attached to them to the point where she doesn't want to scrap any of them. But when you have an 8 episode runtime, as a professional writer, you sometimes have to make the tough decision to scrap or exclude characters that you like for the sake of the integrity of the final product, and she couldn't bring herself to do that. As a result, the show's pacing suffers greatly for the sake of including all these characters to the point of becoming the worst aspect of the show. This show, on top of introducing its gargantuan cast, is also simultaneously trying to tell three stories at once. Initially, the primary plot is Charlie trying to prove sinners can be redeemed by trying to improve the cast members throughout episodes 2 through 4, only for it to be thrown out for a heaven versus hell plot through episodes 5 through 8, in addition to there being the subplot of Angel Dust becoming a better person in episodes 4 and 6. I think all of these plots are interesting enough to be worth exploring, but not all at once, within the runtime that was provided. There is so much that happens in this season that you could easily spread it out throughout two seasons, which it absolutely should have done. The first season of Hasman Hotel should have focused on the premise it introduced us to, which is the hotel trying its hardest to rehabilitate sinners. This would have given the audience time to get accustomed to the cast while naturally exploring the dynamics between the characters while simultaneously providing world building. Throughout the first season, we could have got to see the cast bond not only with each other, but with the viewer as well, as we see the struggles and tribulations the cast must overcome for the sake of achieving this monumental goal of getting into heaven. Only for in the last episode for Charlie to get to show all the progress the viewer witnessed the cast make to Adam, only for him to shoot it down. This would have made the viewer care and want to see Charlie's dream succeed, as we would have known how hard she and the rest of the cast would have worked to get to this point, and would have made a second season where we get to see the heaven versus hell plot all that more personal and have higher stakes. But instead, those events happen in the first episode, and the character growth happens over the course of the series, while simultaneously setting up the showdown versus Adam. 
But like I pointed out, there just isn't enough time for the viewer to connect with the cast or their cause for it to hit as hard as it should have. And that doesn't just apply to the premise and overarching plot of the show. That applies to every single moment in the show. The show never stops to take a breath so that the viewer can process what is happening before it's already rushing to show something new. This makes the entire season feel like a blur, and by the time you finish the season, it can be difficult to even remember the events of two episodes prior. While I was watching the season, I just could not connect to anything happening in the show itself beyond the events of episode 4, except for when Adam was on screen because he is my favorite character but nothing else in the entirety of the season left a lasting impact on me, which makes this season one of the worst possible things a show can be. Forgettable. So what could have been done to avoid this problem? What could have been done to try to add some more breathing room to this overly rushed show? Well, let's analyze some moments throughout the series because despite there being oh so little runtime, this season loved to add plots and characters who ultimately didn't matter. Firstly, the episode 1 B-plot was completely pointless. I understand that it was there so that we could get to see the supporting cast interact with each other as a sort of meet and greet with the characters that the audience will be spending time with. But when you are so strapped for time, you have to make every moment matter, and the entire making a commercial thing literally went nowhere. Couldn't have they gone on a field trip to explore hell so we get some world building, or have done bonding exercises like they did in episodes 2 and 3? My guess that the reason they were given such a meaningless task is because the writers didn't want the cast to start bonding with each other too quickly, and they wanted Serpentius to be introduced and integrated into the rest of the cast before doing so. But the end result of this decision just made the B-plot feel like it was wasting time. This pilot episode is such a mess that it needed a complete rewrite, as there is a reason why most fans consider it to be the worst episode, which is really concerning because the pilot is supposed to leave a positive lasting impression on newcomers so they want to continue watching the show, which this pilot failed to do. Secondly, Carmilla Carmine. This character was like a parasite on this show's runtime. Almost everything revolving around her could have been easily written out of the show to make it better in some way. In episode 3, she takes up nearly half an episode for there to be the grand reveal that she killed the angel so that she could defend her daughters and the show acts like we are supposed to care and emphasize with her despite the viewer being introduced to her within the same episode and not knowing anything about her. The entire dead angel mystery was intriguing for the first three episodes, but was it really necessary? The point of the dead angel was a call to action for Adam to speed up the extermination process, but this could have been easily replaced with the fact that Hell's population is beginning to overflow due to the increasing population of humanity and how more people are sinning in the modern age more than ever before. This would have completely written out the need for Carmilla to call the meeting, Velvet's only moment in the entire show, and given the desperately needed time to focus on the other plot of episode 3, which was the cast learning to trust each other and bond, which by the way, all happens off screen, so the viewer is not personally invested in the camaraderie between the central cast. But then how would have Alistair had known to use Carmine weapons to fight the angels you may wonder? Well, he wouldn't have to. This should already be common knowledge. Hell has existed in this universe for 10,000 years, and it took up until now for someone to realize that Carmine weaponry can kill an angel? It took 10,000 exterminations for someone who owns a Carmine weapon to try and use it against an angel. This isn't sloppy writing. This is just bad writing, plain and simple. 10,000 years ago, it was around the end of the last ice age, and since then, humanity has developed self-driving cars, virtual reality, and OnlyFans. You're telling me it took hell 10,000 years for someone to attack an angel with a weapon that was specifically designed to kill strong beings within hell? And that's not even mentioning that these supposedly exclusive and hard to find weapons are just made out of the steel that angels use for their weapons, which I guess are supposedly just left behind by angels after the extermination is over? 
In 10,000 years, no one has acquired one of these angels' weapons, except for Carmilla Carmine, and tried to use it against them? Of all the sloppiest, most inept writing decisions made by Vivian Madrano, this is easily the worst offender. Anyways, ignoring the amateur level writing, let me point out that Vaggy securing the Carmine weaponry didn't actually have any bearing on the battle ahead. The only moment of any value that comes from her securing the weapons is when Angel Dust shoots an angel while protecting an egg minion which was wholesome and the moment that confirmed he has improved, but was it worth wasting half of episode 7 and 3 on? And before you say, well, the hotel would have been overran by the angels without the weapons because they needed to arm the cannibals to defend the hotel. Well, I say, how much did that actually come into play? If you rewatch the final episode, the cannibals are only seen using the weapons in a single scene. To get around this, Vivian could have just as easily made it so that Adam in his pride to obtain a personal victory sends the exterminators away to attack the rest of hell, while he and Luke get to personally kill the residents of the hotel. After all, as far as he knows, the residents of hell can't even hurt him. So why bring his entire army to attack a single hotel? Everything about Carmilla Carmine and the angelic weapons MacGuffin could have easily been rewritten and scrapped along with Charlie's recruitment of the cannibals, which would have saved a total of a whole episode and a half, which, by the way, is nearly a fifth of the show's total runtime. Thirdly, the Vs, specifically Vox and Velvet. I like the Vs, and Vox is easily one of the best characters in the show, but the reality is that he contributes next to nothing to this season. Episode 2 may be one of the season's best episodes, but ask yourself, if it was really necessary to introduce an entirely new character such as Vox, as a means of integrating another new character who we met in the same episode into the main cast. You really don't think an established character from the original pilot like Cherry Bomb couldn't have been utilized in episode 2 as a means of motivating Serpentius to join the hotel? Which would have given us time to get to know her, so that is one less character that has to be introduced in episode 6, and would have built up her relationship as Angel's best friend over time, and be a representation of the bad behavior that he's trying to put behind him. Vox didn't need to be in episode 2, and he didn't return until 6 episodes later to act as a comedic relief, which I admit were some of the best parts of that episode, but weren't good enough to justify introducing his character into the show to begin with. But Vox doesn't even hold a candle in purposelessness when compared to Velvet. Seriously, what was the point of her character? The only thing she does in the entire show is bicker with Carmilla and then just disappear from relevance for the rest of the show. She may have taken up less screen time than Vox, but she's a great example of Vivian introducing characters just for the sake of introducing characters instead of introducing them for a good reason. What is so infuriating to me about Velvet is that she could have been a great character for integrating the Vs with the rest of the show. Her entire spiel about wanting to go to war with Heaven at the point where she was introduced may have seemed brash, but don't forget that what Velvet wanted to do is exactly what Charlie and our main cast end up doing. You would think there would be some overlap here between the Vs and the main cast for this very reason, yet it isn't even acknowledged by her in the final episode where she's watching her plans and beliefs actively put into practice by the Princess of Hell. The way Velvet is introduced to the audience makes her seem like she was going to rally some of the overlords to fight against Heaven, and if that had been the case, could you imagine that instead of Alistair sending Charlie to Cannibal Town, where we are introduced to yet another character, he instead mentions that there is an overlord who has been rallying the other overlords to fight against Heaven, and would love to have Charlie's support, and then introduces her to Velvet. This could have been such a tense moment where we get to see Charlie make a deal with the Vs to aid in defending the hotel, especially since one of the Vs wants Alistair dead, and another actively abuses one of her tenants. This would have naturally integrated the Vs with the main cast of the show to fight against Heaven, alongside any Overlord's Velvet rallied, making the entire battle against Heaven vs Hell seem much more grandiose, while also developing Charlie as a natural born leader, as she has the most powerful and feared members of Hell supporting her taking a stand against Heaven. But instead, we get Velvet presenting the very idea that the cast utilizes later on in the show, 
and then she doesn't even follow through with it at all and her actions have no consequences whatsoever. Velvet is the most painful example of why having too many characters is a bad thing. Instead of characters like Velvet who are introduced and have an effect on the story, she is instead thrown away because Vivian wanted to introduce Rosie who takes up the role that Velvet already had. Lastly, and I already know people are going to hate me for this one, Episode 5 should have been completely rewritten and Lucifer should have been written out of the season. Lucifer is a great character, who took everybody by surprise in one way or another, but his presence comes at the expense of Charlie as a character and is a spotlight on the show's biggest flaw. Episode 5 is almost entirely centered around Charlie mending her relationship with Lucifer, and on paper, this is a great idea, since Charlie really needed something to make her grow as a character that wasn't related to the hotel. And since Vaggy was completely pointless at this point of the show, and Charlie pushing past Angel Dust's boundaries just ended up being a joke, Lucifer was the perfect opportunity to explore her character more, but everything about her interactions with Lucifer felt artificial and lacking depth. I get that Lucifer is her dad, so she may act differently around him, but it feels inconsistent with her personality to be so awkward around him. Up until this point, she is the most outgoing and welcoming character in the entire show, so her being reluctant to talk to her father felt out of place. This would have been more appropriate if at some point it had been established that he let her down or hurt her in some way, like him approving of the extermination, which is actually acknowledged by her momentarily and then never brought up again, but she cites the reason for their disconnect as just not being close. Okay, but why is that? Why are they not close? It's hinted that Lilith may have separated them when she was young, but Lilith at this point has been gone for seven years, yet she has never tried spending time with him? There are also instances when Charlie acts almost more passive-aggressive towards Lucifer rather than awkward, as if she has a grudge against him, but that's never alluded to, and with her being such a forgiving person, those moments almost feel like complete character assassination. What makes this entire dynamic even weirder is that once he shows up, she instantly starts warming up to him, despite Charlie acting like so much as talking to him over the phone is like a punishment in of itself. The final nail in the coffin for the supposed tension between the two is that at the end of the episode both of them admit to have been wanting to get to know each other, but for some unsaid reason neither took the initiative over the last seven years. Again, this would make sense if there was some established reason as to why these two are so hesitant to even interact with each other, but there is absolutely no context or circumstance mentioned that warrants the way these two act when around each other. The reason why this is such a big issue is that as a byproduct of the show never taking the time to build up the tension between Charlie and Lucifer, the payoff of them making up with each other at the end of the episode rings hollow because the viewer isn't given a reason to care. Before episode 5, I don't think Charlie even mentions Lucifer outside of her reading the story of Hell at the beginning of the series, in which she seemingly paints him as a victim, so based on that instance alone, one would think that Charlie would admire her father for trying something new and being berated for it, just like she is doing with her hotel. The reason why this is such a big problem isn't only that it undermines what the entirety of what episode 5 was building up to, but it highlights the biggest problem this series has. The show is trying to do so much that it can't properly build up to many of the plot points that are supposed to hook the viewer, which makes a lot of the payoffs fall flat. This happens as early as the first episode where Charlie fails at pitching the hotel to Adam, Carmilla Carmine's reasoning for killing the angel, Vaggie's reveal as an angel, and the reveal that heaven isn't as great as it seems. You could apply the failure of Lucifer and Charlie's bonding moment to most payoffs in this show, and that's what makes Lucifer's purpose in episode 5 so infuriating. It's the perfect example to point to as to why it can feel like so many events in this show feel pointless and forgettable. It's because the show doesn't have the time to properly build up to many of them. In Lucifer's defense, you can't actively blame his character for ruining an entire episode. Episode 5 was fundamentally flawed to begin with, but you cannot say the same for episode 8. Like I already said, I like Charlie, I think she's a great character and throughout the series we are repeatedly teased that Charlie is holding back her true power. 
So in the final episode where Charlie takes her final stand against the angels, she finally shows her full power when she undergoes a magical girl transformation and she and Vaggie start riding on dragons. This moment was awesome and the grand payoff to all the hints we see throughout the show of her holding back her anger. So what happens after she transforms? Well, I kid you not, the first thing that happens is one of the dragons instantly gets killed by Lou, and then right afterward Charlie gets backhanded by Adam off her dragon into the hotel sign, and we never see the other dragon she was riding on come into play again. What? This giant reveal, and something that the fanbase has been looking forward to ever since the original pilot, literally consisted of her and Vaggie riding on dragons, only for one to die instantly, and for Charlie to get knocked off of the other one, which is never seen again for the rest of the battle. What was the point of the dragons then? Their entire purpose was to act as forms of transportation to separate Vaggie and Charlie so they can have their one-on-one -on -one battles, which I guess kinda matters, but couldn't they have just split up on their own? Anyways, now that Charlie is in her most powerful form, she finally gets a chance to stand off against Adam, who is the central antagonist of the season and has been tormenting Charlie ever since the first episode. This is it. This is the chance for Charlie to live up to being the Princess of Hell and finally show how powerful and dangerous she can be. So what happens? She stabs Adam in the wing when he's off guard, which doesn't critically injure him as he flies later in the episode, and kind of just shrugs it off. And then, Adam proceeds to start beating the crap out of Charlie anyways, only for Lucifer to save her and then defeat Adam. This is some Star Wars sequels levels of writing. This was Charlie's moment, after constantly being a failure to prove herself, and she doesn't do a single thing of any consequence. Sure, there was that moment where she blocks Adam's punch, but would it have really changed anything if she didn't? Lucifer would have just gotten back up and defeated Adam anyways. And this is why I said earlier that Lucifer's existence is at the expense of Charlie's character. Lucifer completely robs and overshadows Charlie's importance from the moment he arrives in the final episode. Charlie doesn't actually even do anything even before fighting Adam, as she doesn't kill a single angel, and then immediately gets defeated by Adam with little difficulty. And once Lucifer arrives, he is able to defeat Adam with barely any effort. For those of you who don't know Bible lore, the only beings stronger than Lucifer are God and Archangel Michael. Adam is only the first human soul to enter heaven. He probably would have lost if Charlie and Alistair fought him together, which would have been great to see, but instead, the third most powerful being in all of creation is paired against him. Adam didn't even have a fighting chance. Lucifer's arrival in episode 8 wasn't only unnecessary, it actively hurt the episode itself and trivialized Charlie's transformation. That's not to mention that now that Lucifer is in play, he can stop any future exterminations, which in case anyone forgot, is the entire reason why Charlie built the hotel in the first place. So with Adam being dead, who was the entire reason why the exterminations even happened, there may not even be another extermination which undermines the purpose of the hotel, and if Loot does lead another extermination, Lucifer will have no problem defeating her. Lucifer, in every single purpose he had in the show, made this season worse in a multitude of ways, and even though he is a great character personality-wise, he should have just been written out of season 1 and placed in season 2, which would have given us an entire episode to make the show better in any way, and made the season finale all that more climactic and Hell's victory over Adam actually feel like it was earned. So, taking into account everything I pointed out as what needed to be rewritten or scrapped entirely, being the B-plot of Episode 1, all of Carmilla Carmine's scenes, Velvet and Vox, the cannibal recruitment subplot, and everything in relation to Lucifer, that frees up a grand total of two whole episodes needing to be rewritten, that being Episode 5 and 7, and half of three other episodes needing to be rewritten, being Episodes 1, 2, and 3. That brings us to roughly three and a half episodes worth of screen time that were poorly utilized. That's nearly half of the entire show. It's easy to make the argument that a lot of this show's flaws aren't the writer's fault since after all, they were only given eight episodes to tell a story, which I agree isn't enough time. But given all the flaws I pointed out, with only two full viewings of the show, 
there is no justification as to why three and a half episodes worth of screen time felt so pointless, unrewarding, or just poorly written. You can blame Amazon all you want for the amount of episodes they gave the writers, but at the end of the day, it's the writer's job to make the most of what they were given, and they simply failed to do so due to desperately wanting to show off every character Vivian has ever designed. This entire season is held back by the fear of not getting another season, and traded in the pacing and overall quality of the season to play it as safe as possible, which is to include as many characters as they can, even if it hurts the show, which it did. So since the writing and pacing of this show is a bust, are there any redeeming qualities besides the characters' personalities? While I could parrot the praise that so many animated shows get, which is the voice acting and art style, are extremely high quality, which, yes, the voice acting is incredibly well done, and the animation, despite me preferring the fluid animation style of the original pilot, is also above average. But at the end of the day, neither of those qualities come close to justifying watching this show. But there is one other quality that I have not mentioned yet, and is the most memorable and arguably best part of the show. The songs. Oh yeah, in case you didn't know, this show is a musical, and the songs in it are top notch. I would say that probably 80% of the songs in this show are some of the best songs that have ever come out of a Vivian Medrano product. I'm confident in saying that the songs in this show are going to be Hasbin Hotel's legacy, and are easily the best part of the show, to the point where it almost feels like the songs are the main focus of the show, and everything else surrounding them is like a really long music video to tell a story surrounding the music, and yes, that is a backhanded compliment. I should also mention there are two songs in every episode, which given the quality of the songs, one would think is a good thing. But given everything I have mentioned about how little runtime this show has, and taking into account that each song runs from about 2-3 to three minutes long, that's at least 4 minutes of music, and at most 6 minutes of music in every episode. Or, in other words, at the very least, 20% of every episode's runtime are just the songs, and if each song is 3 minutes, that percentage increases to 30%. If we meet in the middle, that means that just the songs alone make up for a fourth of the season's total runtime. That's the equivalent to two full episodes. In Hasman's defense, a lot of these songs do carry meaning and are tied to the narrative, but believe me when I say that some episodes did not need two songs with all the other things happening within them. As for the show's comedy, it's just fine. I didn't really find myself laughing or even amused at the majority of the jokes throughout the season, mainly because of their poor timing, simplicity, or delivery. Thankfully, Nifty, Serpentious, and Adam carried this show's comedy. It's amazing how throughout an episode, 90% of the jokes can fail to entertain me, only for one of these characters to be on screen, and for me to go from unamused to audibly laughing out loud. I'm not exaggerating when I say that 90% of the jokes delivered by Adam and Nifty are some of the funniest moments from any Vivzipop product, and Sir Pentius is following close behind them. If it wasn't for these three characters, I probably could have counted on one hand how many times I laughed out loud, but these three all presented some of the best moments this show has to offer. Hasbin Hotel's first season isn't a mess, or a bad show but it has so many flaws, and they almost all revolve around the runtime. I don't like giving Vivian the benefit of the doubt based on her creative choices with Hell of a Boss, but in her defense, 8 20 minute episodes provided too short of a runtime. Viv is simply not a skilled enough writer to pull off telling a cohesive and well paced story within 8 short episodes, but I can't think of many shows that have. But like I have already said, it's the writer's job to make the most out of the runtime, and I can tell she tried by telling as many stories as possible by giving every episode an A and B plot, in lieu of one central story for each episode, with the exception of episode 4, 8, and arguably 2, which ironically most people agree are the best episodes in the season. But no matter how good Vivian's intentions were, this decision was a bad call, and it crippled the storytelling and pacing of the show. This show was ambitious, and I admire that, but no matter how much you love this show, you cannot deny it tried to do too much. When you have an 8 episode season that is trying to juggle 3 plot lines, 2 songs per episode, and introducing and utilizing over 15 different characters, there was no way this show wasn't going to feel exorbitant or unreasonably fast paced. Hasbin Hotel is just 
barely able to carry its own weight, with its needless side plots and overcrowded cast, character development that felt artificial or took too long to happen, and narratives that didn't really go anywhere, were unnecessary, or felt like set up for a second season. The only aspects that kept this show standing was the music and the characters who were more entertaining than not. And even though I consider this season entertaining, which is the most important thing a show can be, has been Hotel ultimately failed to satisfyingly deliver on most of the concepts and ideas it introduced, making the entire project feel hollow and unrewarding by the time you have finished the season. Before you found out about me, did you know angels could be harmed? No. Angelic weapons? It's that simple? How has no one else figured this out? <laughs> ah!